Since it is officially Spooky Month, I think now is a good time to go over the full backstory and lore of the Spooky Month series, reviewing each episode and the important characters and theories that arise in each. Now, for those of you that don't know, Spooky Month was created by a YouTuber by the name of Senor Palo, aka David Casanova, back in 2018. And the series mostly focuses around Skid and Pump, two children that dress as a skeleton and a pumpkin, respectively. And as of the making of this video, there are five episodes, and each focuses on some crazy Halloween-themed adventures that the boys get into, and I say Halloween themed because not every adventure takes place during Halloween. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at episode one. So episode one kicks off in Skid's bedroom where we see a digital clock on his desk that reads September 30th before changing to October 1st, indicating that it is indeed spooky month. Of course, Skid has to call his best friend Pump to share the news before going downstairs to let his mother and grandmother know. And this is where we actually see his mother, Leela, being held at knife point by a man named Bob the Sub. And while a lot of people think that this first episode of spooky month is just a joke episode or a throwaway episode, there are actually quite a few characters that pop up again in later episodes and are important to the lore. Bob is definitely one of these characters. Now one interesting fact that I want to point out about Bob here is that when Leela actually offers him candy, he seems to be completely over trying to kill her, at least long enough for the police to pop up and take him away. I wanted to point this out now because this is a theme that we'll be continuing to explore, especially when we get to episode 5 and see Bob again. Now next we see Skid rushes off to share the news of Spooky Month with his grandmother, who straight up looks like a zombie before meeting up with Pump outside. The first person that the boys run into is Frank, who offers the children candy before driving off and kidnapping a child. And while Frank is considered an antagonist or a bad guy in this show, for my knowledge, he never actually targets Skid and Pump, and I'll give you my theory on that after we look at each episode and his involvement in them. Because as the series goes on, we actually get a little bit of Frank's history and it will all make sense why he doesn't actually target these two children. Now, after their encounter with Frank, the boys go to see a movie and even stop at a graveyard for a moment, but a more important event is when they go up to the attic and the boys decide to use a Ouija board. This scene is important because it involves two characters that are crucial to the lore, the first one being Moloch and the second one being the protective mannequin that many believe to be Skid's father, which is another theory that we're definitely going to explore as we progress through the episodes. Now, with all the important bits from episode one covered, let's move over to episode 2 which is called The Stars. Now episode 2 starts with two burglars breaking into Skid's house trying to steal something that Tall Thieves describes as just being the stuff. And then we're hit with this image of Skid looking like a real skeleton, which is one reason that a lot of people theorize that Skid is actually dead. But no, honestly, that is a theory that I don't necessarily get behind, but I will explain as we go through the episodes why people truly believe this, because there are a couple of instances that I guess kind of make sense. Now back in the episode, Skid doesn't actually really seem to be bothered with the obvious criminals in his house, so he dashes off to celebrate spooky month but luckily Leela is able to catch the thieves now before skid leaves the house to meet up with pump we see him pass the staircase that leads to the attic and Malik asks him to be free but of course skid leaves him trapped in the ouija board when Skid gets outside, he calls Pump, and this time Pump comes soaring from the sky and lands in front of Skid's house unharmed. A lot of people try to use this in order to claim that Pump is also some type of superhuman or that he's also not alive. But in my opinion, I think a lot of these instances that pop up in the episodes are just a little funny animation or a way to make light of the episode because there are actually some dark themes that pop up here. But with that being said, there are things in the series that make me think that Pump is more than he seems. This just isn't one of them. Now the boys decide to go for ice cream and of course meet Frank again. And even though Frank is obviously a kidnapper, he gives Skid and Pump some regular ice cream while giving the kid that comes after them lace ice cream that knocks him out. Again, showing that Frank seems to be unwilling to harm Skid and Pump, almost as if he has some type of affinity for them. Next, we see another important character that pops up, and that is this clown character that also seems to be a kidnapper, judging from the fact that he knocks his kid out and literally throws him into a sack. And later on, we even see that this character is connected with the cult, which is a big part of this series, but we'll get back to that as it pops up in the episodes. Now, next, we see the boys go to Pump's house and use the computer of his sister Susie who promptly chases him out and then we see Pump's grandpa who looks like he's about to have a heart attack but is saved by the power of the spooky dance. Pokemon! It's a Pokemon! This next part may seem unimportant to some people, but this scene with the bullies is very interesting because they are the first people to actually do harm to Skid and Pump, and the leader of the trio named Roy sends the boys to this creepy mansion on the hill. This is important because it almost seems like Roy is setting the kids up to be abused by his uncle and that maybe Roy was possibly abused by his uncle as well. I say this because when Skid and Pump get to the house, the uncle says, Oh kids, you just got tricked. And now it's time to get my treats. And this is one of the few times in the entire series that Skid and Pump know that they're in actual danger. 
but luckily this demonic tree looking creature rips through the floor and takes the boys away from the pervy uncle. The boys seem to be taken to a different plane of existence while this creature that is called the eyes of the universe actually speaks to them. During this time Pump seems to be horrified and completely under the beast's control while Skid seems to be completely unaffected and this is the second reason why so many people believe that Skid is actually dead. No living person should be able to resist this creature but again I don't buy that theory. Now while at first it seemed like this creature was going to harm the boys in some way, when they actually informed the creature that it was spooky month, it seemed to take a liking to them and come back to reality and rushes out of the mansion. Thankfully crushing the creepy uncle as it rushed out of the house. As the boys ride on the creature's back, they encounter the three bullies again who are quickly caught in the monster's gaze and falls victim to his power. Luckily Skid and Pump break the eye contact by saying that they want to go get candy, which leads us to my favorite character in this series, Kevin. I don't think this guy has any serious ties to the overall lore, but he does have some of the funniest lines in the show. With that being said, when the boys get to his candy shop, they ask for candy of course, while also bringing eyes into the shop. And while we don't get to see how Kevin reacts, we see that all three of them end up with candy in the end. And I highly doubt that they have to pay for it. After this, eyes leaves while telling the boys to always look at the stars. And then we are taken back to Skid's house where the two thieves have been arrested and are sitting in the back of a cop car. And that's basically the end of episode two. But there are two things that I wanna point out out here. The first one is that if you look in the background here, you can actually see Eyes is actually watching over the boys, and this is something that we'll see in several episodes. Right here, we can actually see that the stars in the sky are winking at the boys. Now, this is one of the reasons that a lot of people think that Pump has been possessed by this creature, but in my opinion, I think if anything, the creature just kind of blessed Pump. That's why he has this ability to have his eyes glow and actually see paranormal activities, and we'll be able to see this more as we go through different episodes. The last thing that I want to point out here is that the thieves were in Leela's house to get something even though they didn't tell us what but as we get to later episodes we learn that Leela is connected with this cult and also her husband is connected with this cult and I think they were in there to grab something like that but as we explore more episodes I think that'll become more clear with that being said now let's head over to episode three now episode three is where the animations start to get a bit longer and the lore really starts to come together this episode begins with Leela doing various things around the house like cooking, watching TV, and even trying to sleep, but she keeps getting interrupted by Moloch who's banging around in the attic. One other thing that I want to point out here is that this is also where we see Leela working in this episode, and judging by what's on her laptop, it would seem that Leela is either a home designer or like an interior decorator. I've heard other people say that she might be an architect, which is also a viable theory. Another thing that I want to point out here is the post-it note on the board behind her that reads, tell creators to finish their damn animations on time. I know a lot of people think that this is directed at Leela, but I think that this is actually Senior Palo making a joke about how long it actually takes to make an animation, and how even when you have a deadline, sometimes things just just don't work out. Sometimes if you want your animation to be really good, it's just gonna take as long as it takes. Now back in the episode, we see that Leela quickly becomes fed up with the banging from Molek. And since she thought that it was a rat, she ends up calling an exterminator. And as you can see in the phone book here, there's a barcode that we'll take a look at later because it does have some secret messages in it. Now after this, we see Skid leave the house to meet up with Pump who comes out of a grave, which of course is another reason that people make these theories that he's actually dead. But I honestly think that this is just for comedic effect. Now as the boys are heading to the mall, Frank Frank pulls up and offers them a ride, and when they get into the van, there's a sack that obviously has a child in it. And even worse, the child starts to struggle to get out of the sack, but Frank gives the boys some type of liquid that puts the poor kid back to sleep. Meanwhile, the exterminator makes it to Leela's house, and this guy seems absolutely crazy right off the bat. If the look in his eyes didn't give it away, this line definitely did. I am Dexter the Exterminator, at your service. I kill rats, bats, cats, and everything fast. Ah, wait, you kill cats. Oh, no, 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 no. I love cats. I'll hug them until their brains are out. Then we actually cut back to Skid and Pump being dropped off at the store where they pick up the Happy Fellas doll. And this will become one of the main bad guys in the franchise, but not quite yet. Next, we see the boys run into this creepy guy in a trench coat and a huge hat that claims to be a simple candy dealer. And funny enough, that's exactly what he seems to be, from my knowledge at least. This is the only episode that he appears in, and later in the episode, when the boys take the package given to them by the candy dealer over to Kevin's shop, it looks like a brick of cocaine, if we're being honest. But when the cops taste it, it's actually just sugar. While a lot of people thought that this character was supposed to be Monster from FNF, I'm pretty versed in FNF lore, as any of my fans know, and I can definitely and confidently say that this isn't Monster. Anybody that's been playing FNF knows that Monster has his own backstory. And let's be real, if he wanted to trick or do something with Skid and Pump, he definitely wouldn't use candy. He would just snatch him up. Now, after the scene with the candy dealer, the boys actually play dead and are sent to the hospital. And while that's happening, the exterminator, who I would just call Dexter, from now on is in the attic looking for rats. But this is where we learn something very interesting about Dexter. 
he's definitely a psycho and the reason that he's an exterminator is so that he can kill animals to satisfy his needs but before he can get the work Malik actually attacks him and we later learn possesses his body this next part of the episode is usually overlooked by people but I think it's deeper than people believe here we see Leela reading a book called the great one by Simon and when you look up books with this title nothing really pops up but there is a song from 1986 called El Gran Veran which translates out to the great man. And this is basically a story about a young boy named Simon who father wanted him to be a great man. But Simon ended up transitioning when he was an adult, meaning that he went from being a male to a female. The father got angry and disowned his child. And by the time the father's anger passed and he wanted his child back in his life, the child was dying in a hospital alone. And the father doesn't get to even say goodbye. The song is about accepting people as they are and loving them while you can, because you never know when the person's time may run out. Now, some of you may be wondering what this has to do with the lore of Spooky Month, but honestly, I don't think Senor Palo put this book in here just by chance. Over the years, I've made countless videos featuring Skid and Pump because they were added into FNF Mod. And I would always argue with people in the comments about Skid's gender. A lot of people thought that Skid was a a girl and Pump was a boy and they were basing this off a lot of the pictures that we see around Leela's house showing Skid with long hair. And my counter to this was always that boys can have long hair and even the weird bowl cut that we see in a lot of Skid's pictures. And there's also this clip here from episode 5 where Leela is literally calling Skid her son. It's the Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up! Get up, get up. Oh, you're louder every year. I know son, go get ready. But after looking at the lyrics of the song and actually understanding the meaning behind it, I think that it could be possible that Skid is actually trans and Lilo is just trying to respect her son's preferred pronouns and way of life because he simply doesn't want to be like Andres from the song who lost contact with his son because he couldn't accept the person that he wanted to be. Let me know if you agree or disagree with my theory down in the comments and I'll also put a link to the song down in the description so you can go check it out and I'll make sure to put it both in English and Spanish. Now next in the episode we see the boys leave the hospital and run into the three bullies and something that stood out to me here is that Robert and Ross seem to be afraid of Skid and Pump because they remember that they are friends with eyes. But for some reason Roy seems to have forgotten about the whole ordeal until his friends actually remind him. And even stranger he still bullies the two kids even though he's obviously afraid of eyes. Some people have pointed out this maybe because his whole family is involved with the cult that has been kidnapping children, so maybe having lived that type of life, he's just built different. But we'll speak more about this when we actually see his parents in a later episodes. Now in the next scene, we are back at Skid's house and we see that Leela is being attacked by Malik who has possessed Dexter's body. And while it seems like Malik is getting ready to destroy the boys, they are able to get him to take himself out by asking him to turn his head around, which of course causes him to snap his own neck. Now the episode on YouTube ends with Skid, Pump, and Leela watching TV, but in the real ending on Newgrounds, we actually see the cops going to the creepy uncle's mansion. Now when in the mansion, we see a bunch of members of the cult, including the kidnapping clown character. The cult seems to be speaking in Latin, and while I can't understand Latin, it seems that the clown is basically translating it all for us when he says, <laughs> We will take all and get everything. Everything will give us more than his all. <laughs> Now with the true ending, we can go back and look at a few points in this episode, the first one being the barcode on the phone book. So this is the image that the QR code takes us to and there's a lot to unpack here. The first thing that we're going to take a look at is the bottom right corner with the Latin writing and what looks like the top of a cultist hood. And just as I suspected, when you put the Latin into Google, it translates out to what the clown was saying, which is we are everything and everyone. Everyone is going to give us more than everything. Something else that I find interesting here is that the cultist picture has actually been ripped out. And initially, I wasn't sure if this was Leela's doing or maybe her late husband. But after watching the whole series, I'm pretty sure that Leela does this whenever she has like a memory that she doesn't want to actually remember. And I'll make sure to point this out as we go through the last two episodes because we see it very well. And I know some of you may be wondering why I think that Leela and her husband were associated with this cult. And that's because right here in this scene when Dexter is in the attic, we actually see robes that the cultists wear on the shelf here folded up neatly and we even see the amulet that they were wearing around their necks right here on the shelf next to it. Something else that I find interesting is that there's two boxes here as well and on one of the boxes is scribbled out and I'm going to assume that that box belongs to the husband because as we look through a lot of these episodes we'll notice that the husband's pictures are always scribbled out or just ripped apart. And this other box reads remember which I'm truly unsure of the meaning but I think it relates to either remembering her husband's involvement with the cult or to simply remember her husband in general which I think may be like some type of fail safe she put in place for when she's actually willing to address what her husband did or maybe what he was involved in. 
Now, some other things that stood out in the QR page is Dexter's ad, where it reads that he will exterminate rats, bats, and wasps and everything fast, but in person, he definitely said he also kills cats. I think that this was just a way to say that he's basically a psycho that took pleasure in killing animals in general. I also thought that it was interesting that the kidnapping clown ad was right next to the ad that says, lost your son, I probably have him. While I think that the kidnapping ad was actually from Frank, I don't think that it's a coincidence that the two kidnappers are placed right next to each other. The next thing that I want to point out is the ad at the bottom that says do not buy it. It basically talks about a dog coming to life and trying to hunt him down, which is foreshadowing for what's going to happen with Dexter and the Happy Fellas doll. And the last thing I want to mention before moving on to episode 4 is this image in the mirror at the beginning of the episode. At first I thought that this figure was the mannequin, but after looking at it closely, it seems that this figure actually has arms, while the mannequin does not. And it's also clear that the mannequin is upstairs with Moloch. My theory is that maybe this is the actual spirit of the father, but I'm not truly sure about this one. Next up we have episode 4 and this one starts out with Skid watching TV with his happy fella doll. And just like at the end of episode 3, the doll seems to be looking at Skid. Which I actually overlooked at first, but after watching this episode and seeing the doll come to life, it makes perfect sense while the doll was looking at him like that at the end of episode 3. Now while this show is playing, Leela makes an interesting comment about Skid being different now that he has this doll, and she also mentions him wanting a cat even though he hates cats. But later in the episode, this will make sense, and in my opinion, it paints Dexter in a slightly better light. Next in the episode, we see that Leela takes Skid over to Pump's house and we get to see a little bit of Pump's life. I notice that even though his sister can be a bit mean, she also acts as a parental figure considering the fact that their parents never seem to be around and their grandfather is really, really old. With that being said though, I don't think Pump's parents are bad people and I will give you my theory about them as we look at pictures that pop up throughout this episode. Now, while the boys are trying to steal crayons from Susie while she's streaming her artwork, we also see that Dexter is in the kitchen stealing a knife and definitely setting himself up to be the major antagonist in this episode. And if there was any doubts about this, we see him literally try to kill Pump's grandpa by stabbing into the back of the couch. But luckily, Skid finds him before he can actually stab through. And when the boys take him up to Pump's room, we see him drawing a picture of himself and two other people covered in blood, which we can assume to be Skid and Pump. This transitions to Dexter actually tricking the boys into playing the knife game, which is really just a way for him to get them to close their eyes so that he can stab them. But luckily, Susie walks in right before he can actually do it and anything bad happens to the boys. Now, something interesting that I find about this scene is that Susie says that she's going to call their parents if Pump keeps misbehaving, and Pump is pretty confident when he says that they'll never answer. It makes it sound like their parents are workaholic or maybe that they travel for work so it's hard to get into contact with them. Now another reason that I think his parents are decent people though is because when you look at the picture on the wall here it reads we love you so much and when you actually look at the picture they both look like they're young business people who probably just love their kids and are working a bunch to try to give them a good life honestly. In the next scene we see the boys sneak into a horror movie and this is where Dexter claims that he needs to go pee which of course is a lie because he is a doll. Dexter sneaks out of the theater and he's immediately spotted by Frank who thinks that Dexter is a child aka an easy payday. Frank snatches him up but quickly learns that this is not a normal kid, punches him in the face and then throws him into the back of a police car. And when the cops come back to their car and see the doll in the back seat, they decide to take the doll to Kevin's candy shop. Something that I want to note here is that the older cop is sick and this is related to the real ending on Newgrounds but I'll come back to that near the end of this episode because it'll make more sense then. Now back in the theater, Skid and Pump realize that they have to go after the doll, and while this isn't super important, they run into two hobos, who I think are supposed to be parodies of Tank Man and Steve. I say this because of how they look, first of all, and the fact that they're making out. For whatever reason, Tank Man and Steve are always shipped. Another reason why I said that they're based off Tank Man, of course, is because they're voiced by Johnny Utah, who is the voice actor for those characters. And don't ask me why one of them is drinking the other's pee because I honestly don't know. I guess it was just a cold night and when you're desperate, you'll drink anything warm. Next, we're back at the police station and we see Dexter grab a pocket knife out of one of the desks and then he tries to go kill Fat Thief and Skinny Thief. But one of the cops is able to stop him before he can actually succeed. One thing that's interesting about this scene is that a lot of people think that the two thieves are speaking in some type of code or secret message when they're talking about the X. But I'm pretty sure that they're actually just talking about basic algebra. It's weird, right? You move the X to the other side and you have the answer! What? What X? Now with the thieves safely locked away, the cops take the happy fella doll to Kevin and tell him to give it to a kid. And Kevin basically just throws the doll on his counter without much thought. But soon after that, his power goes out like a scene from the Chucky movies and then Dexter comes out with a knife and manages to stab Kevin in the leg, which seems to bring Dexter a ton of satisfaction. 
Kevin does manage to fight him off and throw him into the back alley and then soon after that Skid and Pump arrive in the store and Kevin realizes that the doll belongs to them and while he does seem angry for a moment he seemed to be resigned to the new life that he lives. Pretty much knowing that as long as these kids are around he's going to have to deal with whatever nonsense they get him into. Now while Dexter is out in the alley he sees a cat and looks like he's going to try to kill it which really reinforces this idea that Dexter simply has a deep desire or more like a craving to kill. He doesn't really care who or what it is. But luckily for the cat, the Hats gang actually appears and scoops Dexter up. And when Skid and Pump arrive at the scene to actually ask for the doll back, Roy, of course, gives them a hard time. I would like to point out that in this animation, we see that Ross and Robert seem to have matured even more, wanting to just give the doll back, but Roy seems to just be as hateful and childish as he's always been. All that to say, Roy makes the boys give their coats to him in order to get the doll back, and when the boys make it back to Pump's house, we see an example of how Susie definitely cares for the boys and more importantly acts as the primary caregiver for Pump making sure to warm the boys up and giving them hot cocoa. We also see that Susie starts to say Pump's real name here, which starts out with W-I-L. When I went online to get a list of baby names that start with Will, I was surprised to find that there's like over 400 possible names. And while some of them were supposed to be girl names like Willow, that's not necessarily true. And I've met plenty of boys who have more traditional girl names. So it is really hard to actually pin down what his name could be, but I'm gonna assume it's something in the vein of like Wilmer, Wilbur, or Wilbert, because they are the most common. And I'm also pretty sure I read somewhere that Pump's name is definitely not Will or William. Next we see Leela come back to pick up Skid and of course Pump has to tag along as well. But before they leave Skid runs upstairs to find Dexter sitting in a trunk slash chest. And when he actually picks the doll up we see that there is a barcode here. Now luckily I was able to get onto Reddit and actually see where this barcode takes us to once you piece all the pieces together. And thanks to a poster named Hey Trixie, we actually get sent to this page where it has a bunch of notes that were written by Dexter, it seems. Now, day one allows us to see that this is definitely Dexter trapped in a doll. He even states that the last thing he remembers is the monster, which of course he knows is Moloch. There's also the note at the bottom here that speaks about Pump's ability to see all things paranormal and the fact that he realizes that Dexter is more than just a doll. We also see a few notes stating that he needs to kill something and two notes specifically state that Dexter is the one that wanted the cat so that he has something to kill. Which takes us to the note here where he keeps repeating that he can't kill them because they are just kids. Now many people think that Dexter is a part of the cult but I think this series of note kind of shows us that he's not. It seems that he simply has a lust to kill things and if he can get his hands on animals he will be sated with that. We clearly see that he is actively fighting against his urge to kill people, at least for a while, even trying to come up with a plan to get Leela to actually buy a cat so that he could get his fix with that instead of trying to kill one of the little boys. So while this may be weird to say, I don't see Dexter as just being straight up evil. While he's obviously not a good guy, I do have to give him credit for the fact that he understands that he has a real problem and he's actively trying to find ways to get around like not murdering people. And I think that the fact that even when he was a human, he actively went and became an exterminator so that he would always have a way to kind of sate the hunger that he has. And in a way, I feel like if he could have gotten that cat or even some other small animal, he probably would have never gone after any people to begin with at all. Now, something else that I want to bring up here is that I don't buy like the Chucky storyline that a lot of people are actually trying to put onto Dexter. Meaning that the reason that people think Dexter is trying to kill people is because he needs to sacrifice somebody or something in order to get his body back. And I honestly don't think that's the case. I think he's just a killer and he wants something to kill. The last two things I want to point out here is the fact that we see a family picture here of Skid, Leela, and the father. And once again, he has been scribbled out, just like in most of the pictures and the box in Leela's attic. And lastly, there's a note that says, there's only junk in photos. She did this to me. The only she I can think of here is Leela, but I don't understand why he would think that she turned him into a doll unless he believes that she was working with Malik all along in order to lure him up to the attic as like some type of trap. Now while looking on Reddit, I also found a discussion of the hidden book, which God bless Reddit because there's no shot I would have found this on my own. Now the book is in Latin, but I have a translation here from a person named FoxPlays22 and here's what it actually says. When the moon is seen at an hour without light, the newly weakened soul can show a new world to God, which was nothing and is now all. He has seen the flesh from all the necessities of life, of green wine, for the habit of turning darkness return before eternity. This pile of skin, when the soul has filled our eyes, can see us this vessel, and when we are drowned to shine into heaven without light, we become incarnate the way all things in this kingdom and call Ura. 
In the beginning, it was the ugly text, for the covenous man essentially owns my body. Over time, the webs become conscious, so she almost succumbing to merciful lies, her greed can be seen on her cheeks. One night, when the town was covered by darkness because you talked to me about something that is more ominous, but as soon as it is near, the omen will become nothing and everyone will be nobody. I didn't believe, I thought another lie, but then he showed me. I saw everything we had lived and then I saw the evil that was waiting for me, and now I come back. My body became paralyzed, my mind was weakened, and my life was short, for I saw that this eternal nightmare and the pain of the creature, I made a pact. Make me forever, for you will prohibit all things, like all of you. Now, I believe that there is more to this writing that we'll see in the future episodes, but my working theory is that this is likely written by Skid's father, and I think he met with the eyes of the universe, similar to how Skid and Pump did, and just like Pump, I showed him something, but whatever it was must have been terrifying. I think the encounter with the creature somehow cut the father's life short, so he ended up making a deal to serve eyes in a different form, aka the mannequin. This was his way to first of all not simply just die and also stay and protect his family. Well at least the best way he can in his current form. There's also this weird image here and I think it symbolizes eyes taking over the world. Oddly enough, eyes looks like a dying tree, and when you look at this image, it looks like a large creature is in the center of the circle, which I believe to be the earth, and it is spreading its roots and branches throughout the world. And right under the image is the word Tamor, which translates out to fear, letting us know that whatever is happening here is not a good thing. With all that being said, let's get back to the episode proper. In this scene, we see that Leela has gotten the boys back home, but this is where we see Dexter actually break down. Dexter is definitely trying to kill the boys at this point, but one thing that I find kind of funny is that Skid and Pump want all the smoke right now. But luckily, Leela sees that this doll has a knife, and she has the sense to grab the boys and start to run towards the attic. When they get up there, they try to hide, but Dexter finds them pretty easily, but before he can actually attack them, the mannequin falls on Dexter. Basically giving me another reason to believe that this is the husband trying to protect his family the best way he can. I also think that it's interesting that right before the doll falls, we see another image of Leela and her husband. Leela takes the kids downstairs and this is where they make a plan to kill Dexter. The boys act as a distracting while Leela stabs him in the head, but while he's gloating, he doesn't realize that the true plan is for the boys to push him into the oven. And this is where we learn that burning him will definitely get the job done. But before they can celebrate their victory, June comes in with another happy fella doll, and Dexter's spirit is transferred to it. But they quickly throw that doll into the oven as well, and the threat is taken care of. Now, the YouTube ending is similar to how it began with the Happy Fella commercial, but the Newgrounds ending is a bit more interesting. It shows the cop sitting in this guy's home office, and something that I noticed immediately is that there's a picture of him with his daughter, which is probably why he's so invested in this case. The second thing that I noticed is that he also has a dirty mug, which is the reason why he was sick in the actual episode. More importantly though, it shows us that this scene happened before the events of the actual episode itself. We also see that the cops seem to have a bunch of evidence about the cult on their board here, and there seems to be a cultist spying on them in the background, meaning that these cops are probably getting pretty close to cracking this case. The scene ends with the cultist actually breaking into the house and setting himself and the house on fire. But I don't think this guy actually dies because he's wearing one of these amulets, which in the next episode we learn basically gives you the ability to be super durable, right? It doesn't make you actually immortal, and we'll see that when we look at Bob again, but it makes you dang close to it. And I'm going to give you my theory of who I think this guy is in the next episode because there is a guy that is covered in bandages that I think might very well be this cultist. Now the final episode in the Spooky Month series at the time of making this video is called Tender Treats. Now this episode starts off with Bob walking to what seems to be his house or either some type of hideout and then we see a newspaper come into view to let us know that he is broken out of prison. And it seems that he's been locked up for about three years and if you remember back to episode one he was actually arrested for trying to kill Leela. We also learned that Bob worked at a place called Boys and Grills and he would actually sell some of the meats from his victims to his customers. Something else that's interesting on this newspaper is the fact that the mayor has been questioned about his lack of funding for the police. Obviously between the killings, kidnapping, and the cultists, there is a need for more than two cops and yet the mayor is dragging his feet on this issue. 
My theory is that the mayor is actually a part of the cult and I will prove it throughout this episode. The last thing that stands out in this newspaper is the fact that there is a missing person photo of Dexter, but we all know what happened to him in the last episode. The next scene has the mayor scolding the two cops that have been on this case. And funny enough, the cops actually defend themselves by saying that the mayor knows that they can't possibly crack this case with such limited numbers. And yet the mayor isn't hearing any of it. There's a small tidbit about Bob being active during Halloween. And by the way the mayor is speaking, it sounds as if Bob only kills people during this one night out of the year. And then there's also the scene where Susie is hiding under the bed, and I think a lot of people read too much into this scene. Many people believe that this scene shows that Susie is actually afraid of her grandfather. But from everything that I've seen thus far, the grandfather is kind and simply just a old and kind of weak man, to be honest. I think this is simply Pump playing a prank on her, which she even mentions later in the episode. And I find it funny that a lot of people thought this was Bob, because later in the episode, we'll see that his eyes turn blue just like Pump's, but there's no way that Bob was in there, because if he was, Susie wouldn't be alive right now. The last thing I'll say about the mayor is that he truly doesn't seem to care about his citizens. Even when the cops are trying to tell him about the cult, he literally says, Look, mayor, something is going on in the town. There's a cult going around and- Blah, 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 blah. I don't care about your imaginary cult, John. But as the cops were leaving his building, it started to make sense to me. When I freeze the frame here, there is a symbol on the mayor's building that is the same as the actual amulets that the cult members were wearing at the end of episode three. And this is why I believe that the mayor is either a high ranking authority figure in the cult or he's a pawn that is being forced to sacrifice the members of his town, which would explain why he doesn't want to put more cops on the case, even though in this episode he clearly shows that he has at least two cops waiting to replace the guys that work on the case right now. If he truly cared about stopping this cult, he would simply have all four cops working on the case at once. In the next scene, we see Skid jumping around because it's spooky month and of course calling Pump so that they can go out together. As Leela is watching the boys leave, she sees Bob standing across the street watching her house, obviously looking for revenge. Leela tries to call June, but she doesn't really take the situation seriously, saying this. There's a guy outside! And Glad you're finally trying something new. You've gone so long without di- And then we see Bob is actually in the house, approaching Leela with a knife in hand. Something that I find interesting here is that when Bob sees Leela drop a piece of candy, he actually stops chasing her for a moment in order to eat the candy, just like he did in the first episode. My theory is that as long as he's eating something, he won't actually attack people. And we see more examples of this as the episode actually progresses. I think this has to do with the fact that Bob's name is based on one of the seven deadly demons, AKA the demon prince Beelzebub, who represents gluttony and envy. And since he's based off a glutton, it would make sense that he is docile while he's actually consuming, whether that be candy or human flesh. And a fun fact, when you take Bob's name and you actually flip it backwards, it actually looks like Beelzebub. And I think it's obvious that Senior Paolo didn't do this on accident. Now, back in the episode, we see that since Leela only dropped one piece of candy, it doesn't keep Bob busy for long, and he actually chases her through the house and up into the attic. This is where she's actually able to sneak past him and head back downstairs. Something interesting happens in the attic though, and that is that the mannequin actually gets into Bob's way, and you even see it cock his head for a moment as if it's looking at him. But obviously Bob is much bigger than the Happy Fella doll, and he's able to basically knock this mannequin to the side and actually get back down to Leela. But the mannequin did buy her a few seconds, which did end up paying off. Because when Leela actually goes back downstairs, the cops are knocking at her door, so she's able to go tell them that Bob is in her home. But by the time the cops actually make it upstairs, Bob is already gone, and this is where Leela assumes that he is going after her kid. And as she runs outside to see if she can spot Bob, she ends up finding this poor kid that's dressed in a devil costume and just beats the crap out of him. And even though she does attack the wrong person here, I think this is a good example to show that Leela will definitely go to back to protect her kid. Meanwhile, Skid and Pump are out trick-or-treating, and the first house that they go to actually caught my attention. The reason being is that this guy is covered in bandages and at first I thought it might be because he's dressed up as a mummy for Halloween. But in reality, this very well could be the cultist from the last episode that actually burned himself up when he set the cop's house on fire. There's also another scene that happens after this where Skid and Pump run into the forest and something screams while they're in there and I only have one idea for what that will be but I'll discuss that more when we actually get to this episode's QR code because there's an image in there that may make it make sense. 
Next, we see the boys go to a haunted house, and this initial scene is funny to me. We see that this guy is dressed up as a vampire and has a camera and a green screen type thing set up, which is why when he covers himself with the inside of his green cloak, he actually disappears. And it's also why Pump can't see his pumpkin stem. Now, after the boys enter the haunted house, Bob appears and starts talking about the effects of eating human brains, but more importantly, he attacks the man and rips off a piece of his body and starts eating it as he's walking through the haunted house. And as you can see in this scene, Bob isn't attacking anyone else. And I think a part of this reason is because he's actually eating at the time. So that means that he's in this temporary state of calm. In the next scene, we see Leela running out of the house to find her son because she doesn't believe that the cops would do enough. And meanwhile, we see Skid and Pump run into Frank, who claims that he's on vacation, meaning that he's not kidnapping any kids today. Next, we cut over to the candy store where we see Roy's mother buying candy and being a complete jerk to Kevin. But this does kind of explain why Roy is such a butthole. After she leaves, Skid and Pump actually run into the store asking for a free candy cane, but Kevin is having none of the boys shenanigans tonight, telling them to leave because they only bring him trouble. And almost as if on cue, trouble arrives in the form of Bob. Bob pulls out his knife, ready to strike all of them down, but Kevin spills candy on the floor, which of course distracts Bob for a bit. And one thing that I want to point out here is that even though the kids give Kevin a hard time and get him in trouble half the time, he still sticks with them and tells them to follow him. He doesn't leave them behind. He doesn't abandon them for his own safety. And I think that's just worth pointing out. Kevin's not a bad character at all. Now, lucky for the trio, after Bob eats the floor candy, he gets hit with diarrhea and has to flee to the nearest restroom, killing this guy that looks like the senior Palo avatar. And back at the candy store, Kevin actually gives the boys some month old expired candy and sends them on their way. The next scene shows the Hats gang trying to get candy, but Roy doesn't have a costume. So he spots two kids dressed like Sans and Boyfriend from F&F, &F, and he steals their costume so he can actually be a rapper for Halloween. Next, we see Skid and Pump running by with their huge box of candy, and right when Roy is going to terrorize them, we see the other two boys basically jump in and fully stop him, definitely showing that they have matured much, much more than Roy has over the years. To further show this, Robert even politely asks if he can have some candy for his sister, showing not only his maturity, but also the fact that he genuinely is a nice, respectful kid. Now, once Skid and Pump leave, Bob comes from around the corner, and in a way, I think that Skid and Pump saved the Hats gang. The candy that the gang received from Skid and Pump was then given to Bob, which in turn led him to eat the candy instead of chewing on the children. The scene with the boys actually ends with Roy parents coming to pick him up because they don't want him hanging out with, as they say, plebeians. But Roy does show a moment of care for his friends as he actually throws them some of the candy that his mother brought from the candy store. Showing that even though he is rich and kind of spoiled, he does care about his friends at least. Next, we see Rob running to Skid and Pump again while they are singing a little Halloween song and convinces the boys to play hide and seek. But in reality, he's trying to kill them. The boys run to hide in what looks like a butcher shop, and later on, I figured out it's actually the boys and grill butcher shop. And Bob is definitely going for the kill in here. This scene right here, I think, sums it up pretty good. <laughs> Once the boys are able to sneak out, they meet up with Leela and June, but Bob also finds them at that moment. The group runs across the street, making sure to look both ways, but Bob doesn't and ends up being run over by the cops. Now, for whatever reason, when Bob is run over, he turns into like this clay form of himself for a moment, but Bob proves to be very hard to kill, getting up and heading to the police car to slash up the family inside. Something interesting here is that now that Bob has come back to life, Pump's eyes actually starts to glow cyan. And my theory is that now that Bob has used some strange power to actually resurrect himself, or AKA uses this amulet to actually come back to life, Pump's paranormal sensor actually goes off. Another theory that has been floating around in the community is that Bob is literally a demon, but that his true form doesn't actually come out unless he suffers a lot of damage, which is why Pump's eyes start glowing after he actually gets run over. Luckily, the cops are quick to respond and shoot Bob in the back before shooting him like 20 more times to make sure he's down, and this point will be important in a moment. Now, even after taking all those shots, Bob still manages to get up and climb onto the hood of the police car, but he is then run over multiple times and finally gives in to death. Although it is scary just how much damage he can take, you have to admit he is definitely the true definition of a tank. Now, once Leela and Skid are back at their home, Leela pulls out a photo album that shows her as a kid with June, 
but it also shows Bob in the background as well, showing that Leela has possibly known Bob for many years. This may also be what the box in the attic that says remember is referring to. There's also a picture of Skid in the background of the house here showing that he also ate at the Boys and Grill restaurant. Which kind of implies that Leela and Bob were at least on friendly terms even just a few years ago. Something else that I find interesting here is that Leela rips the photo in half which seems to be something that she does whenever she doesn't want to remember something or maybe when she has to acknowledge something that was like a painful memory from her past. I think it makes more sense now why all the pictures of her husband are either scratched out, scribbled out, or just ripped apart. And even why the coat image in the phone book in episode 3 was actually ripped out. Now there are two more things that we need to actually cover here, starting with the real ending. In this scene, the coroner says that she has found this amulet in Bob's chest, which as I stated earlier, is the reason that he's able to actually come back to life. A lot of people think that the amulet has been chewed on, but the actual reason that it has all these dents and pieces missing is because the cops shot the hell out of Bob. Another thing that stands out here is that this proves that Bob is not just some random serial killer, but someone that is actually working closely with the cult. I also want to remind you all again that this same amulet was found in Leela's attic, lying next to the cultist's robes. I think this solidifies the fact that Leela's husband has some type of connection to the cult. And I think a lot of people overlook this line, but when the cops say, They let him out. They work together. It implies that Fat Thief and Skinny Thief may be more important to the story than we originally thought because they are the ones that actually helped Bob escape, or at least that's what it sounded like here. The second thing that I want to talk about are some of the hidden messages in the episode starting with the QR code on June's TV. If you scan the code it will take you to this image. A few things can be learned from here and again shout out to all the reddit people for finding some of this out. Now one link actually takes us to this image of the family picture but close up. And in the reflection of the frame, we actually see the mannequin looking at his family. I think this proves that this mannequin is probably Skid's father. Because as we see here, the mannequin isn't standing in front of the father, right? He's literally standing in front of his son and his wife, like he's looking over them or guarding them. Showing that even in this non-human form, he is still thinking about his family and acting as their guardian angel in a sense. Now the second link takes us to this video where we see how the boys were able to actually get away from Bob in the butcher shop. And then here we have the patient file, which shows what happened to Dexter's body once Moloch actually possessed it. The document talks about how the patient's blood can't be drained because it burns everything it touches and that the skin is so hard that you can't actually cut through it even with a saw. And whoever is working on Moloch's body feels like they should report what they actually found, but instead they just continue experimenting on it. And I think this is going to set up a way for Moloch to be an antagonist in future episodes of Spooky Month. And for anybody that doesn't believe that this is Moloch, I think the eyes right here are kind of like a dead giveaway. And lastly, we have a book that just like the last one is written in Latin, and this is what it translates out to. I lost the point of living in a sense. At night, there are cannons because I dream of fear in the biting horror waiting in the light that surrounds the sky. Sometimes I will break my vessel and the light will consume my essence. But I have learned how a soul can be saved and survive in the course of time and perhaps to live again without fear of the end. Yesterday I walked to the stove to heat my house in the cold of night. They left the town, or what was left of it, as they went thither. He walked through the dark forest and I felt his eyes on my back. I looked around in perdition, seeing nothing but the seed of the earth. I kept walking before seeing the tree, one thing that was cruel to me. He asked, what an unhappy soul runs with a false end. He walked her over to me. His eyes could pass my flesh and be nourished by my soul, and the voice Oh, horrible sound of his dry stone body gradually approaching. I looked at her eye to eye before she asked, I can allow you to live if you will give me a trade. With the terror, I said no fear because I was fleeing and I understood the tree. He showed me how to hide my soul in a new vessel, but in exchange, what he wanted were six children, for their souls are stronger. I will end my life in many ways. A born sinner will not be an exception. Today, in the hour without light, I will try with this vessel. I logged someone and it worked. She moved like a rocket trying to unfold into a butterfly. Unfortunately for them, the monster was hungry. The sense of the living has come, for this will be all to me. But I will bring all things at night. Fear is the end of the hot darkness. For what we know now, it sounds like someone brought six children to an evil tree spirit, or more likely, eyes himself, and sacrificed them so they could gain immortality. I honestly can't tell if this is Leela's husband writing before he transferred his soul into the mannequin, or if this is the origin of how the amulets that give immortality were created. 
I know that a lot of people have this theory that the six children involved Leela, June, and Frank. And just a heads up here, Frank was also one of the people in that picture that I showed earlier. I'll make sure to put it here. And I think this is the reason that Frank doesn't go after Skid and Pump. It's obvious that he was at least friendly, if not straight up friends with Leela and June when they were children. And if I remember correctly, we even learned that Robert is June's son, which may also explain why Frank doesn't go after the Hats gang as well. But back to my original point, it sounds like the children were actually sacrificed. And as we can see here, Leela, June, and Frank are all alive and well. So I don't think any of them were actually a part of this ritual. A lot of people also say that the Hats gang, Skid and Pump, and Susie are like the new six, who at some point will be sacrificed by the cult or by Eyes himself. But I also don't really buy that as well because I seem to have an affinity for the boys so I don't think that he would allow them to be sacrificed. And really I don't see Susie in the Hats game really playing such a big role to where they would be like the main component for a ritual. But again, I could be wrong about it. I just think that we need to see more episodes and see what actually happens. But as of right now, I think these are all the answers that we can pretty much get from what Sir Palo has actually showed us right now. Do me a favor and make sure to click this link in the description if you want to go support Senior Palo. Uh, this is where all his merch is actually at. He has a whole merch store. So make sure to go buy a plushie, buy a t-shirt or whatever the case may be. Because basically when he makes these animations, he allows us to basically use his content as long as we're not just like re-uploading it. And he doesn't like strike channels or anything like that. I know most of y'all are not YouTubers, so you may not understand why that's a big deal, but it is huge. Um, so make sure to go support him. Check out more of his videos. I'll put them down in the description if you want to actually go see like the full videos or any of his other animations. And if you want to check out another one of my videos, check out this one on the screen here. Subscribe today to become a member of the Orse Horse and we'll see you next time with another video. And hopefully, maybe by the time this video is up, there will be a part six that we can review and look at as well. This is Orse, of course. We'll see you next time with another video. Peace, peace.